Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing and clicking the notification bell. You can also support me on Patreon, link is in the description, as well as a link to my social media, my Discord, my blog and all that stuff. Let's continue with Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder. We are in chapter 4, the struggle against which enemies within the working class movement helped Bolshevism develop, gain strength and become steeled. Lenin says, quote, First and foremost, the struggle against opportunism, which in 1914 definitely developed into social chauvinism and definitely sided with the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. Naturally, this was Bolshevism's principal enemy within the working class movement. It still remains the principal enemy on an international scale. The Bolsheviks have been devoting the greatest attention to this enemy. This aspect of Bolshevik activities is now fairly well known abroad too. So first and foremost, the Bolshevik party developed, gained strength and became steeled because of their struggle against right-wing opportunism, economism, Menshevism. In general, all trends which tried to hinder the development of class consciousness or tried to hinder or diminish the role of the proletariat in favor of the capitalists, trends which tried to limit the struggle of the proletariat only to, say, only to trade unionism and economic struggle, or only to parliamentary struggle and reformism, or which tried to compromise with the capitalists instead of fighting against them, etc. etc. And during World War I, starting in 1914, these right-wing opportunists sided with the capitalist class in the imperialist war. He continues, quote, It was, however, different with Bolshevism's other enemy within the working class movement. Little is known in other countries of the fact that Bolshevism took shape, developed and became steeled in the long years of struggle against petty bourgeois revolutionism, which smacks of anarchism, or borrows something from the latter and in all essential matters, does not measure up to the conditions and requirements of a consistently proletarian class struggle. Marxist theory has established, and the experience of all European revolutions and revolutionary movements has fully confirmed, that the petty proprietor, the small master, a social type existing on a very extensive and even mass scale in many European countries, who, under capitalism, always suffers oppression and very frequently a most acute and rapid deterioration in his conditions of life, and even ruin, easily goes to revolutionary extremes, but is incapable of perseverance, organization, discipline and steadfastness. A petty bourgeois driven to frenzy by the horrors of capitalism is a social phenomenon which, like anarchism, is characteristic of all capitalist countries. The instability of such revolutionism, its barrenness, and its tendency to turn rapidly into submission, apathy, phantasms, and even a frenzied infatuation with one bourgeois fad or another, all this is common knowledge." Unquote. And it wasn't just anarchism, there were many other similar movements, many utopian leaders, uh, Tolstoy and various others, and of course individuals are individuals, so even if some guy is uh, petty bourgeois originally, or even an aristocrat originally, well, he can still become a communist. It's possible, although it's very rare. So individuals can do whatever, but when we're talking about social movements and large groups of people, then we have to take into account their class origin and their class basis, and these movements, utopianism, anarchism, various movements like this, they were not based in the proletariat, they were based in the petty bourgeoisie or other classes like that, or in some cases even in the collapsing feudal aristocracy. And this is perfectly logical because Russia was a semi-feudal country, it was a petty bourgeois country. Um, it was a country dominated by small producers and semi-feudal classes, classes which are going bankrupt and being destroyed as capitalism is developing. And even though the aristocrats are not petty bourgeois, they're also uh, another feudal class which is being destroyed by capitalism. 
as these people see basically their world collapsing because capitalism is developing, feudalism is coming to an end, their old world is collapsing, well, they have a crisis and then they might become radicalized. However, they don't become revolutionaries in a proletarian sense, instead they become petty bourgeois revolutionists. They are often idealists, they're individualists, they're extremists. Like Lenin says, um, petty bourgeois driven to frenzy by the horrors of capitalism. The instability of such revolutionism, its barrenness, its tendency to turn rapidly into submission, apathy, phantasms and even frenzied infatuation with one bourgeois fad or another. So these kinds of people, they have a petty bourgeois mindset. Either they look at things in a very individualistic way, or they look at things in a very idealist way, or they just have tons of uh, prejudices and sort of ideological baggage from their background. So um, they might feel guilty because they are not workers themselves. They might be kind of self-hating in that sense. The proletariat as a class, because of its class nature and because of class consciousness, they are collective and disciplined and they can handle organization. But the petty bourgeois by his very nature uh, is not like that. They are an individual intellectual, individual business owner, individual freelancer, whatever they are. They don't like discipline, they want to be their own boss, they don't want anybody to tell them what to do, so to say. The proletariat is used to this long-term, sort of arduous grind of uh, persevering and working. But these people who are from uh, upper class or petty bourgeois or even from some other non-proletarian strata, they tend to be flaky, they get into something and then they quickly give up. They're unrealistic, they jump into something expecting it's gonna be great, and when it doesn't turn out to be so great, they instantly lose hope. They don't have realistic positions, but instead they're either complete opportunists with no principles at all, or they have absolutely extremist principles and they refuse to see realities. Maybe this all sounds a little bit vague, so maybe once we get into the actual um, concrete examples, you'll see better what I mean. So Lenin says, quote, Bolshevism took over and carried on the struggle against the party, which more than any other expressed the tendencies of petty bourgeois revolutionism, namely the so-called Socialist Revolutionary Party, or SR Party, and waged that struggle on three main issues. The SRs, uh, they were continuers of the Narodnik trend, so they were Russian utopians. They believed in a weird form of utopian socialism. They eventually split and the right-wing SRs were extremely opportunist and compromised with the capitalists and allied with the capitalists, whereas the left SRs were absolute extremists. And while the right SRs mainly used reformist methods, the left SRs used terroristic methods. And the original Narodniks too, their main form of political organizing eventually became terrorism. So the, the Bolsheviks waged a struggle against the SRs on three main points. First, that party which rejected Marxism stubbornly refused it, or, it might be more correct to say, was unable to understand the need for a strictly objective appraisal of the class forces and their alignment before taking any political action. I'm not absolutely 100% sure what this means. It could just mean that they're idealist, but I think he could mean more literally that the Narodniks, they never even tried to base themselves in the proletariat, which was the new rising class. The proletariat is the modern class, the class which was gaining strength when capitalism was emerging. Instead, the SRs based themselves in the old classes, so feudal peasantry, feudal bureaucrats and feudal intellectuals and small proprietors and shopkeepers and these kinds of things. He continues, second, this party considered itself particularly revolutionary or so-called left because of its recognition of individual terrorism, assassination, something that we Marxists emphatically rejected. So this is very typical. The SRs considered themselves to be the most left and the most revolutionary because they used such extremist methods like terrorism and assassinations. And 
this kind of thinking still exists. There's there's plenty of people who think that because they use such extreme methods, like the most violent methods, the most radical methods, bombs, killings, beating people up, like you see, even um, not to like hate on Antifa or something, but there's a lot of people who go into Antifa thinking that, oh, it's so revolutionary because we get to use violence and stuff. But really, that doesn't make you the most revolutionary or even the most left, it just... It's a typical expression of this petty bourgeois mindset where you want something cool, you want cool radicalism and cool violence, and you want to be like the most radical guy. Which just, it just proves that these people are, you know, they're LARPing, they're not, they're not actually serious. It's all a game to them. It's just a cool hobby for them. They're like infatuated with this revolutionary romanticism, like, oh yeah, I'm a cool revolutionary. I'm so extreme, but, you know, it just goes to show that they're not serious. And these are also, like, very individualistic methods. Instead of long-term, hard-working, uh, patient, organizing among the proletariat, trying to build the proletariat into a strong force which can actually carry out a revolution through, you know, the power of the masses, instead these people want these individual acts, individual radical acts, that they can carry out personally, instead of trying to organize the masses. Let's move to a slightly different topic, but uh, still very related to this, expanding on these same ideas. He says, quote, The struggle that Bolshevism waged against left deviations within its own party assumed particularly large proportions on two occasions. In 1908, on the question of whether or not to participate in a most reactionary parliament and in the legal worker societies, which were being restricted by most reactionary laws, and again in 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, on the question of whether one compromise or another was permissible. So, um, if the previous section was about ultra-left fanatics, and, you know, in case you don't know, ultra-leftism is this the title of this book is so-called left-wing communism and infantile disorder and the left wing is in quotes because it means that it's ironic these people who say that they're so quote-unquote left uh, they're ultra leftists but ultra leftism is actually not genuine leftism ultra leftism is just right-wing ideology masquerading as leftism you know, like in the previous example, these people who think that, oh yeah, I'm the most radical, they act so radical, and they act so extreme, but that kind of demonstrates that they're not genuine revolutionaries. Because this individualism and this idea that there's these individual heroes who matter, and it's not about organizing, it's about extremist violence, and these kinds of things, uh, are really right-wing ideas, but they are trying to pass them off as some kind of super left ideas. That's why ultra-leftism is really just inside-out rightism. It's not really a horseshoe theory or anything like that, it's just um, being a right opportunist and being a left opportunist. They're both kind of just two sides of the same opportunist coin. Becoming an ultra-leftist doesn't do you any good. You should just be a normal Marxist. You think you're becoming better by becoming, you know, oh, I'm going more left, even ultra left, but there's no such thing. There's no left there. It's all, it's a, it's fake. Ultra leftism is fake leftism. So the previous section was about ultra leftism outside the Bolsheviks, just in uh, the working class movement and society as a whole. But now uh, he's talking about left deviations and ultra-leftism inside the Bolsheviks. So certain members of the Bolshevik party who were making mistakes and they were slipping towards ultra-leftism. That's what they call left deviation, is when you start to deviate from the correct path. And he gives us two concrete examples. Quote, in 1908, the so-called left Bolsheviks were expelled from our party for stubbornly refusing to understand the necessity of participating in a most reactionary parliament. The so-called lefts based themselves particularly on the successful experience of the 1905 boycott. The parliament was in fact swept away by the revolution of October 1905. The boycott proved correct at the time, 
not because non-participation in reactionary parliaments is correct in general, but because we accurately appraised the objective situation, which was leading to the rapid development of the mass strikes, first into a political strike, then into a revolutionary strike, and finally into an uprising. When there was not, and could not be, any certainty that the objective situation was of a similar kind, and when there was no certainty of a similar trend, and the same rate of development, the boycott was no longer correct. Later on in this book, there's a whole chapter about parliaments, whether communists should participate in parliaments or not. But basically, in 1905, there was a revolution in Russia, and the Tsar tried to stop the revolution by making compromises with the people. The Tsar said like, no, 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 stop the revolution, I'm willing to give you a parliament, you don't need to have a revolution, I'll just give you a parliament now. But I mean, obviously it was a scam, the Tsar was only doing it out of panic to try to stop the revolution. So the Bolsheviks correctly said, no, we don't care, we're not gonna go into your scam parliament, because now it's not the time for parliaments, now it's the time for revolution, there's a revolution happening, and we're waging that now. And if everything goes according to plan, then the revolution is gonna overthrow the Tsar, and that's the goal. So they boycotted the parliament, they didn't go in. However, the revolution eventually failed, and then the revolution was over, and uh, it really would have made sense to go into the parliament, because now there wasn't a choice between revolution or parliament, because the revolution had failed. But the so-called lefts, refused to accept that, and Lenin explains in more detail. He says, quote, The Bolsheviks' boycott of parliament in 1905 enriched the revolutionary proletariat with highly valuable political experience. It would, however, be highly erroneous to apply this experience blindly, imitatively, and uncritically to other conditions and other situations. And that is oftentimes what ultra-leftism is all about. Ultra-leftism is about black and white thinking. They think that the parliament is always bad. You don't need to take the objective conditions into account. You always use the same methods in every situation. You don't have to do any analysis of the objective conditions. You just always use only the most extreme and most revolutionary methods. And you never use any other methods. Because you want to be the most extreme and the most revolutionary and the most ideologically pure. But that's idealism. And that's actually completely anti-Marxist and right-wing thinking. As ironic as it is, but these people who think they're so extremely revolutionary are actually very anti-revolutionary and are actually propagating anti-proletarian views. So, whereas the ultra-leftist never wants to make any compromise, he never wants to change his methods even if the situation changes, he never wants to adapt to the actual reality, the right-wing opportunists, they are willing to compromise everything. So they um, are even willing to compromise on all of their principles. But the correct thing to do, the Bolshevik thing to do is, yeah, you can change your methods, but you can never sacrifice the core principles. So it's tactically very flexible, but on its principles, it's very solid. Of course, doing that in practice can be difficult, you know, mistakes happen, but that is what we should strive towards. Lenin continues, quote, The Bolsheviks' boycott of the Duma in 1906 was a mistake, although a minor and easily remediable one. Well, what does he mean by that? In 1906, the revolution was failing. It had basically already come to an end, but there was still a hope and there was still a chance that maybe it could be revived and restarted. That didn't happen. That was a mistaken view. But it's very understandable why that mistake was made. So really, it would have been best to go into the parliament in 1906. That would have increased the influence of the Bolsheviks uh, over the masses and over the working class. It would have given the Bolsheviks more opportunities to spread their views and their ideas and uh, gain influence. But it was an understandable mistake. He continues, quote, The boycott of the Duma in 1907 and 1908 and subsequent years was a most serious error and difficult to remedy. 
because on the one hand a very rapid rise of the revolutionary tide and its conversion into an uprising was not to be expected. So why was the boycott in those years such a big mistake? Well, because there was no justification for it, first of all, because by then the revolution had clearly ended. There were still some uprisings in 1906, but by 1907 and 1908 the revolution was clearly over, so at that point it was an obvious mistake to still cling to the method of uprising and not to realize that, okay, well the uprising is now over, now we have to adapt to peaceful methods again, and he continues, quote, Today when we look back at this fully completed historical period, whose connection with subsequent periods has now become quite clear, it becomes most obvious that in 1908-14 the Bolsheviks could not have preserved, let alone strengthened and developed, the core of the revolutionary party of the proletariat, had they not upheld in a most strenuous struggle the view that it was obligatory to combine legal and illegal forms of struggle, and that it was obligatory to participate even in a most reactionary parliament and in a number of other institutions hemmed in by reactionary laws, sick benefit societies, etc. Unquote. Basically the point that he's trying to make is that if they had done what the lefts wanted, which was to abstain from all uh, legal organizations, all uh, public mass organizations, then they would never have been able to preserve and even develop and strengthen the party's influence over uh, its supporters and over the working class, and to develop the working class movement in general. If they had abstained from these public mass organizations and public uh, mass forums, then they would have become isolated from the masses and they would have become a small ultra-left sect, which is a real risk. Combining illegal and legal uh, really just means revolution is illegal. That's a form of illegal methods. Going into the parliament or going into cooperative societies or sick benefit societies or trade unions or whatever, those are legal methods. You have to combine both. If you just say, okay, we'll do everything except revolution. If you refuse to do revolution, well, then you're a reformist. But if you say, we will only do revolution and we won't do any of those other things, we won't organize, we won't do peaceful stuff, well then you're an ultra-left, ultra, ultra left. you're just an idealist and uh, it's never gonna happen. The purpose of using these methods, these peaceful methods, is to maintain contact with the masses, grow the party, spread your views among the masses, get more support for the party, more members for the party, all that stuff, because in a time of peace, the masses are doing peaceful stuff. And if you refuse to go into peaceful organizations, well then you refuse to be in contact with the masses. During the revolution, of course, the masses are doing revolution, and then you have to do revolution too. But when the masses are not doing revolution, then you have to realize that, and you have to act accordingly. The communists cannot do the revolution themselves. It's the masses who carry out revolutions. The communists are supposed to help and lead and guide and march in the front ranks, but they need the masses always. Lenin continues, In 1918, the so-called left communists formed a separate group or faction within our party. In the same year, 1918, the most prominent representatives of so-called left communism, for example, comrades Radek and Buharin, openly acknowledged their error. It had seemed to them that the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was a compromise with the imperialists, which was inexcusable on principle and harmful to the party of the revolutionary proletariat. It was indeed a compromise with the imperialists, but it was a compromise which, under the circumstances, had to be made. There's a whole chapter in this book called No Compromises? Question mark, which talks about this in more detail, this idea that you can't ever make any compromises. Because that's a general ultra-leftist thing, is they claim that they never make any compromises. Because they are idealists, they don't take into account the real-world conditions, instead they live in a fantasy land of ideology. Marxism is like a religion to them, it's not a real-life living movement. So, the left comes, in this instance Radek and Buharin, 
they said that no, we cannot sign the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk because it is a compromise and we can't compromise ever. What was the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk? It was a peace treaty between Russia and Germany at the end of World War I. So the Bolsheviks had promised that they are going to leave World War I, they're gonna bring peace to Russia, of course they would have to do it. The left comms, though, said that they can't do it because you can't ever make a peace treaty with an imperialist or capitalist country, because that supposedly goes against principles. It also had a more real-life sense. The left comms claimed that if the Bolsheviks make a peace with Germany, then the German Revolution is gonna have more problems, and also they would have to give some territory to Germany. However, Lenin's position was based on the recognition that they couldn't defeat Germany, they couldn't defend themselves from Germany, because the Russian army had collapsed completely, there basically wasn't any Russian army left, so they couldn't defend themselves from Germany. They could either make the peace or they could all die and they could, you know, see their revolution fail. So Lenin thought, I mean, whatever, okay, we have to, we have to give them some territory. Tough pill to swallow, but we have to do it. And it would be great if we could help the German workers do revolution, but we can't. Because we don't have any army, we don't have any resources. From an absolutely practical standpoint, there's nothing else that they can do besides just sign the peace. And uh, eventually, Lenin was able to basically force the left comms into it. But generally speaking, ultra-leftists don't like to think about realities. Like I said, they see everything as black and white. You can't ever make compromises. And Lenin gives this very um, interesting further example. He says, quote, Imagine that your car is held up by armed bandits. You hand them over your money, passport, revolver and car. In return, you are rid of the pleasant company of the bandits. That is unquestionably a compromise. I give you my money, firearms and a car, so that you give me the opportunity to get away from you with a whole skin. It would, however, be difficult to find a sane man who would declare such a compromise to be inadmissible on principle or who would call the compromiser an accomplice of the bandits, even though the bandits might use the car and the firearms for further robberies. Our compromise with the bandits of German imperialism was just that kind of compromise. They either sign the peace with Germany or Germany kills them all. What is there to be gained by senselessly getting themselves killed? Nothing good is gonna come of it. It's not gonna help anybody. It's not gonna help communism. In fact, it's just gonna kill the Russian Revolution. He goes on. But when in 1914-18 to and then in 1918-20 to the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries in Russia entered into compromises with the bandits of their own bourgeoisie against the revolutionary proletariat of their countries, all these gentlemen were actually acting as accomplices in banditry. Pretty ironic, the SRs, who, you know, sometimes they act as complete ultra-lefts, and extremists, but then they also collaborated with the Russian imperialist bourgeoisie, which just goes to show that the ultra-leftist of today is the right opportunist of tomorrow, or the right opportunist of today is the ultra-leftist of tomorrow. They're both just different sides of the same coin. Quote, The conclusion is clear. To reject compromises, quote-unquote, on principle, to reject the permissibility of compromises in general, no matter of what kind, is childishness, which it is difficult even to consider seriously. A political leader who desires to be useful to the revolutionary proletariat must be able to distinguish concrete cases of compromises that are inexcusable and are an expression of opportunism and treachery. It is very annoying and very inconvenient, but it's true that you have to actually analyze concrete cases and objective conditions. You can't just say, all compromises are always bad, or no compromise is ever bad. No, uh, unfortunately it's not as simple as that. You have to really look at the objective conditions and each case. He goes on, One must learn to distinguish between a man who has given up his money and firearms to bandits so as to lessen the evil they can do, and to facilitate their capture and execution, and a man who gives his money and firearms to bandits so as to share in the loot." Unquote. The ultra-lefts, 
they would have gotten the Russian Revolution killed for no reason. The Bolsheviks were willing to make a compromise with Germany so as to save the revolution, but the right-wing opportunists, they were willing to compromise with imperialism to a degree which actually did nothing to benefit the revolution, but actually was completely against the revolution. They supported the imperialist war effort. And why don't I give two other historical examples? One of them is from a long time ago and another one is recent. So, the Soviet Union in World War II. Sometimes people say, well, how could the Soviet Union work with the Western Allies against Nazi Germany? The Soviet position was that they would work with all anti-fascists. So as long as you're an anti-fascist, good, we have a common enemy, let's defeat the fascists. Makes sense to me. But an ultra-left might say, no, you can't ever work with any anti-fascists except uh, people who are also communists. Well, what does that do? That actually, that actually strengthens fascism and it helps fascism. It would have made the Soviet Union weaker, it would have made the war devastation worse, it would have given the fascists more power, and for what? Because of, um, you know, their so-called ideological purity, they don't want to be tainted because they work with the Western allies. And sure, it is a little strange how you end up in a situation like this, but let's remember that the Western allies, they didn't like the Soviets, they would have never wanted to work with the Soviets, they never even wanted to oppose fascism. So they were on the wrong side of history until they were forced temporarily on the right side of history. Well, how did they get forced? Because the fascists attacked France, attacked the UK, attacked uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. And that is why they all ended up on the same side. So, okay, the Soviet Union is willing to work with American bandits so that they can take out even worse bandits, the German Nazis, and after that they don't have any friendship for the Americans anymore. It would have been different if they had stayed allies with the Americans, or if they had um, become allies with American capitalists for imperialist purposes or something. That would have been quite different. And that brings me to the other example, so Rojava. So the Kurds in Rojava, they are an oppressed nationality, they wanted to have their own state, their own national territory. So they were willing to ally with American imperialism so that they can conquer a territory from Syria, which was uh, an independent country being attacked by the US imperialists. So they were doing exactly what Lenin here says, uh, helping and joining up with the bandits to share in the loot. They were like, oh, Americans, you are, uh, you're attacking Syria, cool, we're, we also want to join, so. So Rojava helped the US set up military bases in there. The US gave them weapons, uh, funds and uh, military support and trained them and, you know, helped them to act as their mercenaries and their pawns. And what happened? The US betrayed them and abandoned them. And, I mean, that's the same thing that always happens. You might be able to use contradictions between imperialists to your own advantage, so let's say you might be able to use the Western allies against uh, Nazi Germany, but if you ally with the imperialists on their terms, then they're just using you. So they used the Kurds as long as it suited them, and then they threw them away. It all comes full circle again, because the Kurds also, they play with this pseudo-anarchistic ultra-left ideology, they say that they're anti-statist and democratic confederalist and they don't recognize authority and generally it's anarchists and ultra-lefts who really like them. So today you're an ultra-left, tomorrow you're a right-wing opportunist, the day after tomorrow you're an ultra-left again. It shows a lack of an ideological foundation. When you don't have a firm proletarian scientific foundation which Marxism provides, then then you just waver all over the place. <laughs>